this thing live, y'all. Let's go. Super excited to be with everybody today. Uh, this is our first virtual grab the key on Juneteenth. So this is a very, very special, very, very special grab the key uh, that we're having here today. My name is Montel Watson. I lead our diversity lending platform here at Movement Mortgage. And I have a bunch of special guests with us here today. Uh, we're going to jump into some very, very special pieces that we're going to talk about today that is sp specifically focused on our first time home buyers, gang. Our first time home buyers. And we're going to have a special event on Juneteenth and we're talking about freedom. Why not talk about financial freedom? And one of the best ways to get financial freedom, yep, you guessed it, is through home ownership. So I'm super excited. Before we jump into everything, man, I, it's very important to, to really, truly ground ourselves, right? As we ground ourselves, like, why are we having Grab the Key? Um, what does what is Grab the Key? Um, what, all of those pieces, right? Where it started. And for us, Grab the Key started in 2018, as we took a look at the uh, the history of housing within the Black community, understanding the history of housing in the Black community. Uh, we wanted to create generational wealth through home ownership, and by doing so, we could do that through educational empowerment. So we've traveled across the country in different cities. Uh, we've partnered with some of the top real estate broker owners, some of the top agents, some of the top builders that are very passionate around bringing home ownership to Black and minority communities. Um, and, you know, for us, we, we think it's very, very important to, if we're going to be helping our communities, we have to be in our communities across the country, right? And so, man, I'm super excited for today. You know, this, you know, having this, this virtual event across the country, Pauline, I don't know if you even remember, girl, Pauline's on here. Pauline, we did a virtual event with you and, and Miss Angela. It was one of our very first virtual events um, but this one right here is very special because it's nationwide for us. We got people joining us across the nation uh, to learn about home ownership and to learn uh, you know, about the different pieces of it that sometimes are very scary, right? So, all right, before we jump in to the, the first time home buyer education information that we have for you guys today, we, we need to learn about Juneteenth, right? We need, this, this is Juneteenth. This is Freedom Day. We need to learn about Juneteenth. So I want to pass it to a very special guest that we have here today, Kim Harrington, one of our branch leaders here in Atlanta. Kim, where are you at big time? I know Kim, and guys, just so everybody's aware, we have watch parties across the country. We have watch parties in, in the A as well. Kim, my man, um, I want to pass you the rock here so you can tell us and educate us a little bit around uh, the history of Black housing and the importance of Juneteenth. Is Kim on there with us? Where are you at, Kim? He's muted. Oh, <laughs> well, you got to come off mute, Kim. That's I know, man. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Got you, baby. All right, perfect. So, uh, Montel, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, virtual and in person. Thank you guys so much for joining us to celebrate this amazing day in history. And so, why are we here? Right? Why are we here? If you, if I can think back as recent as January, this is the kind of feedback I got. Uh, there's no more slavery. We have equal access to things. Uh, for crying out loud, we had a black president. So why do we need to focus on a specific segment of our community? Why do, why do, why do some people need extra attention? And why do I have to? falsely, why do I have to give up something to give to someone else? Mm. So false, 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 right? So progress does not mean all the problems have been eliminated. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a realist. So I need uh, primary sources. Primary sources are facts, right? So what I'd like to do is just, and I'm going to apologize in advance for giving you the Reader's Digest version of what I'm going to share with you because I could spend eight hours doing it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back in time. And the thing about when I made those comments about as recent as January, people that have that view, they're looking at, through, they're looking at it through the lens of nostalgia. American history, uh, the ice cream shop. And someone sitting at the counter drinking a milkshake and the guy serving him has a little paper hat on. 
So we couldn't go to that ice cream shop, by the way. You remember that? You guys don't remember that, but you know what I'm talking about. So we need to look at history, American history. Uh, you cannot look at American history without race and without racism. Uh, could you guys hear me? Okay, yeah. I'm just checking to make sure you're still with me. You cannot look at American history without race and without racism. So trigger alert, because it's not good, right? So let's go back. 244 years of forced labor. 244 years of forced labor prohibited from learning to read, prohibited from learning to write, prohibited from worship, living in awful conditions, prohibited from learning how to swim, that the fear is if someone had the opportunity to swim away, they would do so. If you resisted slightly, you would feel the overseer's whip, slightly. That was the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is that you would be hung in front of everybody, women, children, everybody, as an example. So when I say 244 years, what I'm really saying is 246 years. So the Civil War started in uh, 1861, April of 1861. It was the Southern states trying to secede from the Northern states. Why? Because there was a movement towards um, uh, abolishing slavery. But slavery was free labor. And so people were flourishing. 75% of the world's cotton supply came from the South. Did you guys know that? So you think about cotton, you think about tobacco, sugarcane, rice, forced labor. So why give that up? So as we're moving through the Civil War in uh, September, September 22nd of 1862, Lincoln notified those Southern states that if you don't put down your arms, if you don't do this, I'm gonna free the slaves on January 1st. So when you hear about history in Lincoln, we think that he was this person that said, I'm freeing all the slaves. And that's the reason because I don't like it. So he didn't like it. However, the reason why he did it was because the North, the Union, was not making progress against the Confederacy. So he knew as soon as he pulled the slaves out of that debacle, that they wouldn't have the resources to support their efforts for the Confederacy. So they would lose their money. Does that make sense? Are you guys still with me? All right, so we have January 1st of 1863, Emancipation Proclamation, but it wasn't for another two years, two years until June 19th of 1865, although the Civil War ended back in April. So another two months even after the Civil War ended. So let's, let's move forward. Reconstruction. So there was from 1865 to 1877, there's something called Reconstruction. And Reconstruction basically was uh, reforming of governments. They were trying to get those southern states to integrate well with the northern states. And the problem was that there were rabid white supremacists in the South. And they weren't hearing it. They were like, oh no, we're not doing that. And so they would put these governments in place, these local governments, they would have federal guidance. But the people on the local level didn't want to hear it, so they didn't pay attention to it. And so who would punish those people that didn't pay attention to it? There was nothing called due process back then. You know that, right? No due process. They, we, nobody to go to because they all were like that. They wanted to hold on to that free labor. So I'm not going to go. I would, the reason why I'm sharing it like this is because we all should know our history. I mean, to the little tiny details of it, to understand why we're doing what we're doing. If you are listening and you're a real estate agent or you're a lender, if you don't 
get compassionate and, and passionate about this, there's something wrong with you. This is part of something that you have to do. You have to do it. All right. <clears throat> so reconstruction was a failure. Let's fast forward to 1892 in Louisiana. Homer Plessy. You guys know Homer? So what a lot of people don't know was that Homer was seven-eighths white and one-eighths black. And so Homer got on a rail car intentionally, intentionally got on a rail car for whites only. They knew who Homer was. They had alerted the staff on the train. They had alerted the local law enforcement that he was getting ready to do this. And he knew that he was going to get arrested, but he did it anyway. So he got on a whites only car. And they said, hey, you can't be here. You got to go. He said, I'm not going anywhere. You're violating my 14th Amendment. And so they arrested him. They jailed him. And so they fought this case all the way to the Supreme Court. So in 1896, the separate but equal doctrine, Plessy versus Ferguson, came online. So basically, they were stamping approval for segregation. And so from 1896 until the 60s, the mid 60s, 1960s, uh, was Jim Crow. And we're all familiar with Jim Crow, right? Separate but equal was never ever separate but equal. It was always substandard, always overcrowded, everything that you can imagine. By the way, there's so much history from 1896 all the way up until 58 years later on uh, May 17th, 1954. So Brown versus Board of Education. By the way, there had been cases before that that many people are not aware of. There were people that wanted to attend law school in Maryland and Missouri, and they weren't facilities available for people to go, people of color, to go to law school. They didn't have any. So the Supreme Court said, they're siding with the people that are pursuing this injunction. Say, hey, I, I, we want to go here. So they have to go there, by the way. So no one knows about that, by the way. But these people that attended Maryland, University of Maryland, and Missouri, law school. However, those were like the baby steps to get to Brown versus Board of Education. So we get to Brown versus Board of Education. And basically, they said that uh, segregation is unconstitutional in schools. In schools. So they ordered, they mandated that schools be desegregated. So I'm gonna fast forward for one second. And Portia, if you could pop up that picture for me, that'd be great. All right, so that's, that's my picture, by the way. That's my class picture from, from 1975. That's June of 1975. That's 21 years after Brown versus Board of Education. Do you, do, are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? The only white person in that picture is the teacher is the teacher. And that's 21 years later. So when you think about the time and how much time it takes to make progress, it takes a lot of time. So it's not like right now in 2023, it's easy for people to say, oh, well, just do this and just do that. You have equal access. No, it's a grind. It's a struggle. There's a long history of this stuff going on. Okay, you can take that away, Porsche. Thank you. Don't even worry about where I am in the picture. <laughs> okay so let's fast forward how am i doing montel you good you're good brother you're good keep rocking okay. baby. so let's fast forward to uh, 1964 civil rights act of 1964 lyndon johnson signed that and he said that we had and by the way this was the formation of the eoc by the way same civil rights act was the formation of eoc did you guys know that? In 1964. So it's illegal to treat people differently. It's a segregation is illegal. No separate water fountains, no separate, nothing, nothing like that, right? 1964. 1965, vote right back. Now I'm going to blow your mind right now. If we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964, why? Did we need the Fair Housing Act of 1968? It should have been covered. 
But what happened was real estate agents, financial institutions were discriminating against black people. So there's a family called the Rochelle family, um, African-American couple. They were um, upper middle class in New York. They worked for the Fuller Wig Company. You guys familiar with the Fuller Wig Company? Fuller Wig Company is African-American owned wig company. Madly successful, millionaires, even back then. So Mr. Rochelle worked for the Fuller Wig Company. He was a salesman. He was a baller. He would get after it. And he so he was upper middle class. He could have literally purchased a home anywhere. Easily. But he wanted to live in Bergen County, New Jersey. And it just so happens that a CBS news crew was following him around during his housing search. And every time he went to a place he wanted to live, they said, we don't have anything else available. Why don't you go over there? You know what that means, right? Steering. Do you guys know about steering? So, and, and so then they would, the CBS news crew would send in a white couple afterwards. Guess what? Let me show you this and let me show you that. So that's why 1968. And so let's, let's fast forward to 1977, CRA, Community Reinvestment Act. So all these things matter. All, of these, all the history of it matters. The slow pace of things matter. The reason why we have a grab the key event, the reason why we want to communicate information to you guys is because you can have the knowledge. So there is a wealth gap between white families and black families. Here in Atlanta, at least a few years ago, uh, white households had 78% home ownership, black families 42. You see the gap? So it's not just a gap in home ownership, but it's a gap in generational wealth. So about legacy purposes, how is someone able to go to college and someone else isn't able to go to college? Because we didn't have the opportunity to own a home and build equity and use that equity to send somebody to college. Does that make sense? All right. So I told you I apologize in advance for the Reader's Digest version, but that's <laughs> what it is. And I'm telling you right now, there's a whole lot in between. If you go back and you guys have heard of Jack Johnson, Jack Johnson was the first black heavyweight champion of the world. And this is back in the early 20s. And, you know, he was just crushing people, crushing them. It was a big deal. So there's a lot of history in between, a lot of history. If we're aware of it, um, just history is important. And what you guys do for a living, you guys make a difference in people's lives, not just their lives, but their kids' lives and their kids that, that aren't even here yet. So that's why it's really important. And by the way, I appreciate you guys being here because we have some other information for you after we go offline. Um, Pauline, I believe it is on you. And Pauline is awesome, by the way. And if you guys have an opportunity to meet Pauline out and about, you guys need to meet her and give her a big old hug because she is a trailblazer uh, in the mortgage industry and she represents extremely well, by the way. Pauline is the bomb. Kim, dude, uh, you getting a, you getting ahead of your skis, man. I know you're excited. You're getting ahead of your skis. I'm going to bring us back uh, before we jump to Pauline, brother. Hey, dude, thank you so much, Kim. Thank you so much for helping us with the history. Uh, a lot of very, very important pieces. And you, you, you hit the nail on the head, right? You talked around. Um, we have to understand and we have to know our history. We got to know where we come from before we know where we're going, right? We have to understand and know that. Um, and so thank you so much for for grounding us there first. Look at that room. I love it. We got it. We got a room full of folks in there in the A, one of our watch parties. Um, but uh, as we move forward, I want to I want to talk about mindset. gang. I want to talk about mindset for all of our folks that are out there. Uh, if you get a chance to uh, pop something in the chat, let us know where you're at. Where, let us know where you're watching from. I see we got several people in the chat and I know we had another uh, 60 or so watch parties. So definitely uh, pop some in the chat there. But as we move forward um, into this next section, let's talk about mindset, right? Let's talk about mindset. Um, and Portia, if you can keep going forward there for, for my presentation as well. All right, generational wealth, right? You heard us talk about that. You can take another uh, step forward as well, Portia. 
BBD. All right, for everybody that's out there, this is not the this is not Bell Biv DeVoe, right? Although <laughs> in the chat, I want y'all love it. Okay, we got Cobb County, we got Western North Carolina in the chat. We got folks popping in. Uh, I want y'all to name, uh, give me some of the the, the members of, 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 of BBD. Um, pop them in the chat. Let's see if you know who they are, right? This is an easy one. This is an easy one. Uh, but for me, BBD, that's right, Ronnie. That's right. Um, but for me, BBD is belief, behaviors, and do the work. Belief, behaviors, and do the work. Before you can achieve anything, you have to start with belief. I'm a firm, as I want you to take a note on this one. There's a book that I always quote. It's called Atomic Habits. Uh, and Atomic Habits, it helps with starting with the belief, right? You have to start with the belief section first before you can move on to actually creating the life that you want to have. And in our community, we have a we have long-term trauma that has been built up and that has passed on from generation to generation. And understanding that long-term trauma, we first have to start with belief. I'm going to tell you all a very, very quick story for me and my home ownership journey. Um, but I started off in my career as a loan officer. I started off uh, from a loan officer to a banker, a banker to an advisor, Series 766 license. I could help people grow wealth. I could help people in regards to getting into homes and qualifying for homes. But I couldn't get over my own mindset on owning a home. I was fearful. Um, every home that I looked, for, looked at when I went through my home ownership journey the first time, I just kept making up excuses of not buying a home. Every single opportunity I had, I made an excuse not to buy a home because I didn't believe that home ownership was for me. I didn't believe it was for me. Luckily, I had a, a, a strong-willed wife that believed that home ownership was for us. Uh, and she got sick and tired of me every single time we looked at a house, uh, making up excuses not to buy the house. And the one that we bought that changed our life, the one that we bought that changed our life, she said, I'm tired of it. We're buying this house right here. And we bought the house and that house changed our life, right? Um, and because of the belief, because of the belief of my wife that helped me believe that homeownership was for me and for us, we changed our lives, right? The belief system has to start first. It has to start first. You have to have an abundance mindset for you, right? Not a scarcity mindset. We have to believe that abundance is for us first. Behaviors. When you, your behaviors and your identity are fully aligned, you are no longer pursuing uh, behavior change. You are simply acting like the person you will already perceive yourself to be, right? That is a strong, strong, strong quote. If your behavior and your identities align, man, everything else will fall into place for you, right? It'll fall into place for you. Once you believe you create a system of behaviors to accomplish that homeownership goal, it can be accomplished. It can be accomplished. The last piece for the BBD for me is do the work. Faith without work is dead, right? We, you can't believe it's possible, but not do the work. We have to step into it and we have to do the work. So it's taking a step forward. Portia on the next screen here for me. Appreciate it. Risk. It's a risk, right? Y'all, it's a risk to own a home. It's a risk of taking those next steps into home ownership. It's a risk. And what that means for me is responsibility, initiative, sacrifice, and knowledge. It is our responsibility for the next generation, right? It's our responsibility. If you know that you don't want to pass on a, a ownership of a home to your to the to the, the, the next piece of the generation in your family and your lineage. It's important to think about how, how else could you pass that on? Could you pass it on to a cause that you truly believe in, right? But no matter what, it's our responsibility to step into that. Initiative, initiative. I was one of the first ones in my family to own a home. It was my, I had to take initiative. My mom, my dad did not own a home and I had to be the one to step into that. And for a lot of us in our community, we're first, we're first generation homeowners, right? And so we have to step into that and sacrifice. We have to make sacrifice to make things work. Um, I'll be the first to tell you, uh, you know, my sacrifice for that first home that, that we bought, uh, we lived through full on uh, renovation of the home. We lived through renovation. Um, we didn't have a, uh, we did not have a, a, a full on kitchen. We did not have um, a fridge. We bought a little small fridge 
to live through of that first home that we bought that needed to be renovated. But once we renovated and we lived through uh, a lot of that sacrifice that we had, the on the other side of it, it was game changing, right? It changed our lives. It changed our lives. And uh, sometimes that sacrifice is, is sacrifice from saving, from budgeting, right? And that's never easy for any of us, right? I, I'll be the first to attest to that as well. And then that last piece here on risk, the K, knowledge, knowledge. That's what this is here for today, is for us to continue to grow and educate ourselves and to educate ourselves around knowledge for all you first-time homebuyers out there um, that are taking the next steps of home ownership. I encourage you to continue to do what you're doing today is educate yourself. The empowerment that you get from educating yourself, from partnering with some of the fantastic real estate agents that we have on this call today that are listening, some of the fantastic loan officers and branch leaders that we have on this call today, continue, continue, continue to educate yourselves. Um, next slide there for me, Portia. So the last thing here that I want to say and encourage each and every one of you what to do next, just do one thing. Do one thing. Do one, the best next thing that you can do to own a home today, whether that is talking to a loan officer, talking to a real estate agent, starting to budget, starting to pay off debt. They'll just do the next best thing. And specifically, another thing that I think is so, so important is make sure that you share your home ownership journey and story with someone else, right? So we have uh, we grounded ourselves on the history of Juneteenth, the history of housing in the United States and in, in, in minority communities. I want us to all have a strong belief system and mindset as we approach our home ownership journey. And next up, this is a very important one. As we started to go down this journey of having this conversation, my girl Pauline, Pauline, where you at, girl? Where you at? We talk, I talked to Pauline and she was like, man, one of the bis biggest misconceptions that are out there today is around down payment assistance and the programs that we have available. This is one of the biggest pieces that we can become educated as a community. Um, and so Pauline, I'm gonna pass it to you, girl. Please help educate us. Please help uh, help a lot of us understand the, the pros, the cons of down payment assistance. I'm gonna pass it, I'm gonna pass it to you, girl. Good morning, it is still morning. Yes, good morning, everybody. Happy Juneteenth, happy Juneteenth. Um, I'm so honored to have this moment to speak with all of you. Um, I'm Pauline Harris. I've been in the industry almost 20 years. And um, it did not take me long to figure out that there was something very different about this experience for minorities and what the home buying experience entailed. And so kind of a little bit of what Montel mentioned about, you know, before I go into too much about DPA is the mindset, the mindset even of DPA, okay? Mm -hmm. Owning a home is so important. Owning land is important. It is our duty as an adult, it is our duty as people to own land. And let me explain why. There are so many reasons why ownership can benefit your family. You keep hearing people talk about generational wealth. Well, what exactly is that? Well, that is property, that is money, that is assets that you can give to your children or children's children, and it passes down and outlives you, basically. Land is one of those one things that we know will do that. And so in order to go into the process um, and it be successful, and it be a successful process for you, you have to have the right mindset, and you have to understand that down payment assistance is just a vehicle, okay? It's a wonderful vehicle. All right, people understood long, not too long ago that, you know what, the people can make payments, all right, they can afford the mortgage payments. Um, we don't doubt that they'll make their mortgage payments because we see their credit, they're paying their creditors. What they fought, what they realized was there was a void in getting the money for the house and putting that upfront down payment, um, making that down payment. So the beautiful thing is, like Kim said earlier, the times are different. There are a lot of things that are being done and opportunity is, is available now that was not available before. If anybody's been in this industry a long time and you remember Nehemiah, okay? <laughs> All right, so that was like one of the, mo the first down payment assistance programs I found out about. And I realized then that, wow, this is really important. That And they took Nehemiah away, um, but beautifully enough, we have other programs available. So I'm gonna touch on some of those programs. 
not going to go into too much depth because I really want you to understand that at Movement, we do have access to down payment assistance, Georgia Dream, Atlanta Housing Authority, Invest Atlanta, Clayton County down payment assistance. Angela is our expert in Clayton County DPA. Um, and then we have two very important DPA products in-house, Movement Boost and Movement MMCA. Now, just to briefly tell you, Movement Boost is the down payment assistance program that we have that we couple with FHA. Everyone knows that 60% of minorities use government financing, FHA or VA, but per, more, more so FHA. So Movement Boost is a wonderful vehicle for people that need down payment assistance and are utilizing FHA financing. Movement MMCA is our conventional version. It's an $8,000 grant. It is absolutely amazing. We've been having a lot of success with that program. And that's another vehicle that you can utilize and it's in-house. Now, the difference between the other programs I mentioned and these in-house is that we don't have to outsource the underwriting for these programs. We approve the down payment assistance in-house. And so that means the beautiful thing is you probably close a lot shorter, you know, it's a shorter time period to close because you don't have to worry about another entity approving that portion because it's all done in-house. We underwrite it, we fund it. All right. So some of the pros of down payment assistance, and, I, and, and we probably already know, right? There's a lot of pros to down payment assistance. Um, they get to keep their money on hand and use the rest of the money to, you know, to furnish the house that we already have. We don't have to utilize our funds. We can use the funds of an entity and keep that more money to use to, you know, furnish the house or turn on utilities. Everybody knows it's more to life after you close. You got to turn on those utilities. You got to stack the refrigerator. Your kids want new furniture, all kind of stuff. So that's one advantage is that you get to keep more of your assets available. Um, sometimes with down payment assistance, you get lower rates. Okay. So depending on the program, for example, Georgia Dreams interest rate is usually a little bit lower than the market, usually about a half to a quarter point, at least lower than the market. Um, the, another benefit of uh, DPA is that some down payment assistance can be forgiven. Um, and I'm saying some because not all is forgiven. Um, it is good for people who otherwise wouldn't have the money to purchase. If you, know, if you think about it, most people, the average person doesn't have thousands of dollars, $10,000, $12,000 to put down on a home purchase. And so without these programs, they, it really makes a difference between owning and not for some. So there's a lot of great things about down payment assistance. You want to ask some key questions, though, when you're getting ready to, do down, to, to decide if you want to do down payment assistance. First, is there a forgivable period? All right, that's important because is it forgiven? Do I have to pay it back or is it forgiven? Some, a lot of these programs are not forgiven or if they are, there's a forgivable period, meaning you it's only forgiven after you live in the house for a certain number of years. For example, let's say 10 years or so. So if you buy a house and you know good and well, you're probably not gonna live in that house past five years or so, or even three years, that's just kind of like right now and you plan to buy something bigger or move or something later, that may not be the best program for you because if there's a forgivable period, say 10 years, for example, if you're moving out of that house in three years, you're gonna have to pay that money back. So what was the benefit, right? Now you went from financing um, three and a half, 96 and a half percent to now having to pay back 102%. So there's some advantages to making sure that you know if this is the right program for you based on your goals and needs. Are there income requirements? And listen, this is a big one. I get this all the time because a lot of people have income from other sources and they're like, well, I just won't tell y'all about my second job I got over here. I'm gonna just tell you about you know, this job. Y'all ain't qualifying me with that one. I'm gonna tell you about that one. The problem is as these people are smart, okay? People that underwrite down payment assistance are very intelligent and they're gonna look at your bank statements. And when they see deposits that are not the deposit of your primary job that they're qualifying you with, if there's a very good chance that that job will show up, okay? So you want to ask about income requirements. You want to be honest. If, you know, you make more money than the income, than the program allows, that may not be the best program for you. There more is likely another. Um, asset requirements. What are the asset requirements? Do I have too much money in my account already to qualify for your program? Because that's also a thing, all right? Last but not least, are there purchase price limits? Everybody in Atlanta, I can't speak for around, but I would think it's everywhere, but definitely in Atlanta, some of these price limits are not going to work in our market, okay? If you can't buy more than, you know, $300,000 on a certain program or, you know, $250,000 or two seventy, dollars like I forget what it is for Clayton County, two fifty. dollars yeah, 
that may not work for everyone, right? Because the price points are higher now. So these are all questions you want to ask. Um, so let's talk real quick about the, the cons of down payment assistance. Again, forgivable period. Sometimes it is repayable. Um, you tie up a lot of your equity. For example, if you put down your three and a half percent, you're going into that house with three and a half percent equity in the house. If you have down payment assistance, it's tying up that three and a half percent until it's that, that down payment assistance is paid off or forgiven. OK, um, some down payment assistance costs can outweigh the benefit. For example, Georgia Dream, I'm a big fan of Georgia Dream, but Georgia Dream charges 2% origination. All right. So figure you get a $200,000 loan. That's $4,000 to get the assistance and you're getting $10,000. Right. So you just paid $4,000 to get six. Does that really make sense for you? All right. Um, sometimes down payment assistance is due upon the sale of the home. That's something that people forget about. You've been making these payments. You're excited. Oh, I got all this equity. You forgot you got this bond or this lien attached to your house. You get ready to sell. Boom. Your payoff comes back and there's an additional $10,000 you forgot about. That's something to think about. That can make or break your whole sale plan, right? Everything you're planning to do, the home you're planning to buy, all of that can be in jeopardy if you're not realizing that, oh, shoot, I got to pay this money back. Um, also, refinancing challenges. Everybody knows this is a very rate-sensitive environment, and everybody's waiting for rates to come down so they can refinance. But when you refinance, if there is a forgivable period on that down payment assistance, Keep in mind, now you have to roll that money that you thought was free into your loan and refinance more money at a lower rate. Does that make sense for you? Okay. Mm -hmm. And last but not least is investment property conversion challenges. If you would plan to, you know, maybe not live in that house long term and, and convert that property to investments an investment property, a lot of these programs have restrictions that you have to occupy. And the moment you make it an investment property, that money is due. OK, so um, one of the things that I want to make sure I, I leave with all of you for down payment assistance is a great thing. It, 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 if it makes a difference between you owning and not, I would say owning is outweighs all the cons. OK, because ownership matters. It really, really makes a difference. Um, so you want to get in the house. OK, and if this is the vehicle it takes to get in there, I encourage you, you ride it. Get in it. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. Just may mean that you have to switch up some things. All right. But the greatest benefit of not using down payment assistance is that you get to grow the equity in your house, which can be converted to cash, which can, which can really benefit your family. And so we are so blessed and fortunate to have Jared Maddox here with us today. And he's going to talk to us about the advantages of equity in a home. But before we, before we go into that, Pauline, thank you so much, girl. Like that awesome awesome job um and you guys everybody on the call today listening you got to hear about the different local programs you got to hear about national programs georgia dream investor land like there's so many that are particular to georgia but but guess what everybody on the call across the nation across the nation we have several different down payment assistance programs uh, that are uh, local to you as well um, man, there's, there's so many out there. One of the most important things, though, talk to your local LO, talk to your local real estate agents, start there first, start there first, they will help you and guide you onto those next steps of understanding what is the right program for you, right? Because that down payment says it's not for everybody. Um, uh, FHA, you name it, all the different programs that are out there, they're not for everyone. We want to get you in a program that is right for your particular individual situation, right, Pauline? That's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. And Pauline, Miss Angela, uh, Jarek, who's on here, Kim, all the fantastic loan officers at Movement Mortgage can help you in that process. So, Pauline, girl, I appreciate you. I appreciate you, the ATL Mortgage Queen. I love it. I see it in the chat, the ATL Mortgage Queen. Um, we're trying to get the chat enabled for everybody. I just realized it's not enabled for everybody. It's only going to panelists and hosts, so we're going to fix that. Um, but before we do, okay, Porsche's got it there. It looks like Porsche's got it. Uh, my man, Jerick, where you at, brother? Where you at? Where you at, Jerick? Right here, man. I love it. I love it. Let's talk about equity. Let's talk about the importance of equity. Right. Like how important is it? You know, Pauline talked about the products. I talked about the mindset, man, that equity is big, right? It's big. It's big. And before we jump in, I got I got a cool stat over the pandemic, right? Over the pandemic, 
black households, black households, the equity in black households grew more than in any other segment. I want y'all to hear that. Over the pandemic, equity in black households grew more than any other segment. There's opportunity out there. There's opportunity out there to grow your equity. My man Jerry is going to dive in a little bit further to understand what exactly equity is and why it's important and what it can do. It can do so many things for you. So I don't want to steal too much of your shine, Jerry. I'm going to pass the rock over to you, my man, and let you take it from here. All right. I appreciate that, Montel. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today to get this uh, valuable information. We appreciate you guys joining us with uh, Grab the Key and uh, you know uh, this program, and we're excited about what it's going to do for for minority families. So again, thank you guys for joining us. Um, we talked about it. Uh, everyone has actually talked about the mindset, but you know, since you know me, Pauline, Angela, um, we're all in the trenches. Um, we get to get to talk to you guys every day and uh, get a feel for for what's going out there. So I agree. The mindset is, is the biggest challenge that I see amongst minorities is just, um, you know, I'll be honest with you guys. Buying a house is tough, um, but there's different levels of, of tough for everybody. Some some people, um, you know, they, they can push through and um, whatever challenges they happen, they can push through and, until they get to that point where they're a homeowner. Uh, some people make it to certain points and they give up. Uh, you know, but one thing I want you guys to understand, I put a verse there, uh, all things are possible through Christ who strength is me. You got to understand when you get to that point, when you're ready to give up, uh, sometimes you're going to have to lean on a higher power, uh, mm -hmm. to be able to get you, get you over the hump, uh, to get you to sacrifice, to get you to have that strong enough mindset to keep going. Um, because one thing you guys got to understand is, uh, as a minority, uh, they kept us from home ownership for a long time. And, 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 and there is a reason why. So think about the reason why we weren't allowed to own property uh, for, for a long time. They prevented us, government prevented us, uh, individuals prevented us. There was, a, there was a concerted effort to keep us from home ownership. And the, one of the biggest reasons why is because appreciation of that asset, uh, appreciation of that home, home ownership changed so many, so many lives uh, for individuals who bought in the 1940s and, and, and before. Uh, it, it changed families. Uh, you know, it took individuals from, from low income to all of a sudden upper, upper middle class and beyond because they bought er so early on in the process and we were kept from having that opportunity. And now that we have access to, to home ownership more so than we did in the 1940s, uh, one thing we got to understand is our percentage of home ownership has not changed since the 1940s. We were in the, in the 30s and 40% in the 1940s, and that number is still there. But guess what has increased? Uh, our percentage of consumer and spending amongst minorities has increased every single year, year after year. So that means we have the resources, we're just not directing it into the right spots. So everybody makes a decision at some point internally to be a homeowner. Right. But what I want to give you so today is some external reasons why you should continue to make that push for home ownership. Like I just talked about appreciation of that asset. Um, one thing that I found with with home ownership, home ownership, uh, the prices have increased an average of five point two percent each year. There's also some periods of time where you get accelerated home ownership. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine bought his house in twenty. 15, well, actually, it was 2016. He bought his house. Um, he bought his house for $110,000. Um, he 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 sold his house. I helped him do the loan. I helped him do the mortgage. It was the first home for him and his wife. Uh, they bought. They sold that house for $270,000 almost four years later. So you telling me, you know, and they were middle class working individuals. I mean, they hadn't had. Uh, you know, these big savings and things of that nature, but who, how would it change your life to get an influx of $160 from the sale of an asset that you bought for your family four years ago? That's life-changing. That is life-changing money. That's what we're talking about when we say appreciation. Those individuals who bought before this big mortgage boom, um, you know, those individuals who, who took and made that sacrifice uh, instead of going on a trip, instead of going to see Beyonce, 
um, and all these different <laughs> things we spend our money on. They made a sacrifice to put that money into their home, and now they're being rewarded for those things because their their home values have increased a hundred. Two hundred thousand dollars every, you know, from two year, over a period of two years. It even happened for my family. And you know who pushed me to 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 buy my wife, just like Montel. My wife pushed me to buy. I didn't want to. I was comfortable. I was comfortable in my first house. But my wife pushed us. We needed more space. And now I'm so glad I did because now I have two hundred thousand dollars of equity that I can use to put my kids through college if I decide to do that when they get of age. Or if there's a business idea that God has blessed me with, now I have the resources to be able to pursue that business opportunity because now I have equity that I've built into my home over from me paying my rent, from the, the home values increasing, I have equity that I can use. And, and sometimes don't, people don't realize is that when you build equity, the equity in your home is kind of like a ready-made savings plan. You know what I mean? You can, those payments that you're making into the home, into your mortgage each month, you're paying off principal every time you make a payment. Every time you make a payment, you're paying off principal, which is allowing you to, to have that difference between what you owe and what your home is worth. That's equity. So for some people, it's a ready-made savings plan. I know I have $200,000 of equity in my home that if 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 I'm a little short with, with, with you know, like I said, my son, when he's ready to go to, to UGA or wherever he wants to go to, then, you know, I, I, I have equity that I could tap into to be able to help my son with paying for college. And now he doesn't have to take out student loans. Mm -hmm. You see how that's changing a generation? You know, I had student loans because my parents didn't take advantage of buying a house when I was five or 10 um, to be able to have equity. So I had to take student loans out myself to be able to pay for school. There's nothing wrong with that. But if they would have bought a house when I was five and stayed in that house until I was ready to graduate from college, they would have equity in their home to be able to pay for me and my sister to go to school and I wouldn't have student loans. And now imagine me graduating from college and not having $50,000, $60,000 of student loans. I could have made some different decisions with my life if I didn't have to worry about student loan payments. You see how the cycle takes place? When you take, when one person in that, in that particular generation decides to make a difference and makes a change and, and, and step out on faith, and 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 pursue home ownership through all different challenges and means and, and and is able to 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 make that happen in their family you will change not only your financial position but you will also begin to see a change mentally your kids will start to, to start to tap into that and they'll start to see that mommy and daddy accomplished something that you know they they haven't seen anybody in their in their family accomplished so now they'll start to believe in themselves and you you will start to see a change that we need to be able to see in our community so we can come together and build and not spend you, you, you as you as you see we spend we spend one of the most in 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 all of ethnicities african americans my nor does we spend so much we just don't spend it in the right areas that that build for us you know what i mean we, we spend it in areas where things will depreciate like vehicles we'll ride around in the flies vehicle um, but but that vehicle is going to be not going to be worth what you bought for it hey, so that's the, why we, we the house so before the car the jerry future. the house before the car right 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 <laughs> that's why i push so much for home ownership because i've seen it change lives and i want you to be a part of that change and the one thing that, you know, I'm going to leave you guys with one uh, key definition here. This is, you know, uh, leverage. Um, leverage is something that a lot of investors use. Um, this is something that America was built on. We have almost, what, a trillion dollars in debt. Some of those things were used for leverage. And what leverage means is using borrowed capital or debt to increase the potential return of an investment. So you so with the house, one thing I want I want you guys to understand, you're you're gonna use leverage. You're gonna use the bank, the mortgage company, whoever, you're gonna use your money, leverage that against the, the amount of money that they're giving you to be able to buy a house. Most people aren't paying cash for homes. You you're gonna have to use debt, but using that debt is good because you're gonna use that leverage to buy an asset that's gonna appreciate in value. I'm tying it all together. Is going to appreciate in value, okay? And because of the appreciation in value, you're going to be able to build equity in that home that you know that you wouldn't have if you were renting. And and that's 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 how leverage works in that particular situation. And then once you bought your own home, the next goal is you want to continue to acquire property, right? Because property is a, is a hedge against inflation. 
property is one of the main hedges against inflation. Cash is not. Cash loses its value as inflation goes on. And one thing we're dealing with now is high inflation rates. But property is a hedge against inflation. That's another reason why you push home ownership. Right. That's right. But the biggest thing is that you have to make a decision. You have to, if you you have to find the reason why. You have to find your yes. And that yes has to stay a yes until you close. Okay. It has to stay a yes until you close. Don't let anybody take away your yes. Don't let your situation, don't let your circumstance take away from your yes. If you made a decision to buy a house, you need to maintain and flow in that yes, okay? And then if you need some help, all things are possible through God, through Christ who strengthens me. And one thing I want to leave you guys with is I just want to show you, I know I've been doing a lot of talking, but I want to show you guys the next slide so you can see a real life example of, of, of what home ownership can do for you and how it can actually change the bottom line, which is the numbers, right? I'm a, I'm a big believer in numbers. So this is a, a, a rent versus buy decision. Um, you know, if you decide to rent, you know, let's say the first year, you know, your, your, your rent is one point, you're going to have an annual, usually rent increases annually by 6%. We're seeing that now. We're seeing rents go up now for everybody, right? But your principal and interest, it doesn't change. It stays the same. And one thing that you'll see is as you're buying that, as you're paying that, 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 that principal and interest, there's an appreciation gain that happens. This is over uh, projecting over a 10-year period of time what your appreciation gain will be on a home that's $250,000. You're looking at an appreciation gain of $107,000, right? And then what you're also seeing is you're seeing the net gain over 10 years of buying that home, $129,000. Who wouldn't want an additional $129,000 from buying something that you're going to be able to live in that's going to be shelter for you and your family? So to me, renting should be temporary. It should be a temporary solution to putting yourself in a position to be able to buy a home so that you can change the generational wealth for your family. And so that's the reason why we're doing Grab the Key. That's the reason why I'm a loan officer is because I want people to be able to, to understand what buying a home can do, not only for you, but for your children and your children's children. We got to focus on, as a community, generational wealth and creating generational wealth for our families. And the, and the easiest way to do that is a home because you have banks like movement mortgage, that's going to give you, if you do an FHA loan, we're going to give you 96.5% of that money to buy the house. You just need the three and a half percent, or you can use down payment assistance. So it, so we, we got to take advantage of these opportunities that are given to us to be able to change our lives and our families' lives. That's the reason why we push so much for home ownership. So when you're ready, talk to us. We're ready to help. We have uh, so many tools available, resources to be able to help you guys with buying a house, utilize your resources. Don't think you have to do this all by yourself. We're here to help and we appreciate you guys again for coming. Angela's gonna share with you some guys, some, some tips and things about credit because I know a lot of people are worried about credit. So we're gonna get that worked out too. We give you guys all the tools. So there's gonna be no reason why you guys come sometime next year should be in your own homes and I'm ready for it. So let's get Damn. it going. Jerry, I'm, I'm about to go buy a house, man. You got me pumped. You got me ready to run through a wall, man. Let's go. Come on. No, thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. You uh, you absolutely crushed it. Um, you, you got my you got my heartbeat going because it is so, so important. Homeownership, it changes lives. And if you can't feel Jarek's passion, you can't feel my girl Pauline's passion. You can't feel my passion, Kim's passion as we talk about this, gang. Like, I, I don't know what to do, right? We, we are passionate about this because we know and understand it changes lives. Angela, bring us home, girl. Angela, Miss Angela, Miss Angela does this, y'all. I'm telling y'all, Miss Angela does first time home buyer. Uh, I was I was talking to her as we were prepping. She goes, "Oh, Montel, I got I, I I do this all the time, man. I I I do this all the time. I got this. I got this." <laughs> so, Miss Angela, um, I'm gonna pass it to you, girl. You bring us home. Talk to us a little bit about some of the different tips around crediting, budgeting as we think about prepping for a home. I appreciate you, girl. I'll let you take it from here. Woo woo! All right. Well, thanks, Montel. Thanks, Jerry, Pauline, Kim. Thank everybody. I'm I'm pumped now. I don't know what to say. I'm coming last. I'm. <laughs> Let me get back to it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah, like Pauline and Jared were saying about home ownership, down payment system, and um 
especially the equity part, it is very, very important to get your credit together. I know everybody, a lot of people do want to buy a home. They say, oh, my credit is not together. Um, it's easy. First thing, first thing you all need to know, you all go pull your credit report from Credit Karma or whoever else. It's a difference between a margin credit score and a consumer credit score. But the scores that you all are pulling are the consumer credit scores. So get with your lender to get a uh, to get a real more uh, credit score because the consumers you all have 54 different score modules. And when you go to Credit Karma and those other places, like uh, even with Experian, those are they give you your consumer score. But when you want to go into home ownership, you want to find out what your credit is like, get with a lender and get what your real credit score is. Like I said, they, they query different things. And also when it comes to consumer credit scores, um, scores go from 300 to 850. And people say, oh, I got good credit. My credit is 550. No, get with them, your lender and let them pull your credit and let them let your mortgage loan officer pull your credit and tell you what you need to do to get your score where you need to be. A lot of times people get scared, like I don't know, I don't, my score is not high enough. Don't be afraid. And no question is a dumb question. Ask. No question is a dumb question. Ask the question about your credit score. Do you have anything um, that's questionable on your credit? Again, don't try to go out on your own and try to fix your credit. You probably can. And you go out and you pay these people hundreds and thousands of dollars to fix your credit, where your lender or your loan officer can pull your credit score and give you the same advice for free. Okay? And don't just start paying off stuff because oh, I'm just paying this off because I want to get my credit. No, that's not how it works. Get with your lender. Give it to your loan officer. Let them look at your credit score. Because a lot of times you all go out there and you pull your credit and you start paying off things that don't need to be paid off. Start doing things with your credit, with your uh, creditors, and it can hurt your score. Don't be afraid to pull up and call a loan officer about your scores, okay? Uh, how credit affects, credits will affect your rates. Uh, I know with FHA loans, you can go all the way down to a 500, but you don't want to go into that with the 500 because you have to have more money down. So use that same money to get your scores up. Don't be afraid because you have your credit is not good. You can always get mortgage ready. You get mortgage ready by contacting your lender, contacting loan officer, contacting your realtors. And realtors should be advising you to go talk to a loan officer about the credit because some realtors, some are really they know about it and some they do not. They are real estate agents, real loan officers. Some things that they will know and like, again, some things that they won't know, but the best thing you need to do is get with the loan officer about knowing your credit. And also to get mortgage ready, you have to, when I say get mortgage ready, look at, pull your credit score, uh, again, like from a lender, or you can go to my FICO score. Those are the scores that the lenders really pull from. I mean, it's on the same uh, module that the lenders board from. Go to my FICO score. Don't go to all these free credit companies because you don't. You have to pay for it. You pay for what you get. Okay. You go to Credit Karma. Your credit score may be seven hundred. You go to my FICO score. Your credit score may be six twenty. Because they query different things. Get with your lender. Get with your loan. Your loan officer. In order to get mortgage ready, think about the mindset. Um, you got to set a budget and goals. You got to know your place where you think where you're ready. When, I, when you get into uh, mortgage rate, when you get ready to set your budget and your goals, because down payment system is good. It really is good. I'm not taking it from anybody. I do the classes at least two or three times a month. However, when you have your own money, you, you control your own destiny when it comes to home ownership, your equity, your building, your home. You control your own equity. And... Uh, and like I said, I'm not taking anything away from anything about if you need down payment assistance. A lot of people do. A lot of people do. But if you know you got your money and you get budget, like Jared was saying, you go out, you go to Beyonce concerts, you do all this. <laughs> when you set your budget to buy a home, I have so many people come to me. They're like, okay, fine. I want to buy a house. But I pull to get the bank statement. They may have $20,000, $30,000 in the bank. No. Lead a down payment for somebody who need it. But what I'm saying is to you is when you set your budget, uh, like Jerry said, you want to have your own financial freedom in your home. And when you set your budget in your home, you have to treat yourself just like a bill. When you get paid, you put your monthly bills just like 
yourself and your bill. Okay, fine, Angela, I'm paying you $200 this month. I'm gonna skip this for every other month. Set, set a goal to save your money, to put your down payment, because everybody don't qualify for down payment assistance. Okay, if you don't qualify for down payment system because your income may be too high, you may have, they look at, like Pauline said, they look at the total household income, not just your income. Your income may be 50,000, but you may have a son or daughter who worked during the summer working at Burger King. They're going to count that income. So just to get your mindset ready again, like I said, you set your budget, you set your budget just in case you don't qualify for down payment assistance. You look at what type of home you want to buy. You look at your income. It's a whole lot of different ways. You can also, before you contact a lender or a lender or a realtor, you get yourself ready. Or if you know how to calculate your, your debt to income ratio, though a lot of these different things is about to get in the mindset of being home ownership because of what we want to do, we want to build generational wealth, but we don't want to build a mindset where I want to get a house and I, what I'm going to need, I'm just going in thinking I'm going to need assistance. But you're going in thinking you're going to need assistance, but you may not even qualify for that assistance. And then at the end of the day, you, you get frustrated. You get so discouraged about home ownership because you don't qualify because you make enough money, but you don't want to get a job that you don't make enough money because you want to be able to afford this home. But get yourself mortgage ready. Again, like I said, we're going to need certain documents uh, before you try to contact the lender. Make sure you have your assets in, in place. We're going to need 60 days of bank, state, of bank statements. Okay. We're going to need those paycheck stubs. We're going to need uh, your assets as far as you're using your 401k. These are things that we're going to need. Okay. Um, and a lot of times people don't want to do their, let me know what I'm doing. People don't want to do, don't want to um, put, give the lenders their statements, afraid that they may see something on there that mm -hmm. they don't want them to see. We're going to see it anyway. We can know everything except with your blood type when you was born. So <laughs> you might always put it out there, okay? Because it's going to be, done, like someone said, you, it's going to be on those bank statements. You can't hide any income. It's so sad. I just had a borrower who quit a second job the day before closing. And when the underwriter went in to pull and get that verification of employment, he quit his job. But, but again, like those kind of things that you have to be conscious and, and think about when you're going to uh, get down papers. I mean, I'm sorry, getting in the house. You have to, have to, have to make sure your credit is in order. Okay. You just can't have a mindset, well, I got a 600. I'm going to go ahead and get a house. No. You want to get it in order you because number one, if you have kids, they are looking at that and they, you know, they go about, they learn behavior, learn behavior. If your credit is not in order, then you got kids and they go into the same situation. Like, okay, fine. I'm just going to do what my mom do. Either you either conform to what your, your living environment or you do better. And we want to do better. I wish, and I tell people all the time, I was just having, uh, over my brother's house yesterday to all these young people, I wish someone had told me how important credit was and how important home ownership was coming up. It would be, like Jerry said, it would be something totally different. Totally, totally different. And also what you want to do, I not also get that credit together. And if you have kids in college already and you have stuff, if you have credit cards that in good standing, you don't want your kids coming out trying to build that credit. Go ahead and add them to your credit cards as an authorized user. Don't give them a card. Lord knows I'm do that. I made that mistake. Get them a card as an authorized user to build their credit. So when they get out of school, okay, so when they get out of college, they already have this 600, 800, I mean, 700 credit scores, 800, hopefully, 700, 800 credit scores. Because the last thing you want to do, like, I didn't want my kids. I was, I feel good. My Both my kids gone out. Of, I don't want you to come back here. Get your own. You know what I mean? So not only... Uh, building credit for yourself, you have to think about your kids. Again, like I said, it's a learned behavior in kids and and they look at that stuff. Again, like I said, get your credit scores together, reach out to your lender. It's not only a dumb question, it's an unasked question. You can't reach out to a realtor saying, well, I'm ready to get a house. First thing of ask, have you been pre-approved? Have you been pre-approved? No, I haven't been pre-approved, but a lot of realtors, they, they will vet you before they get, uh, uh, let you talk with a loan officer, but we're going to tell you the same thing. Mm -hmm. And also, when it comes to, and I, I really want to point this out, 
when it comes to down payment and closing costs, two totally, two totally different things, okay? Your down payment, which is your three and a half percent, your 20 percent, your five percent, what you want to put down. And where I'd like to explain that, and a lot of people say, well, I already put, uh, it's, I didn't know I need no money at the, at the, uh, to close it because I did my earnest money and stuff. Your earnest money really, your earnest money, your earnest money is really like putting your house on the railway, okay? You get your uh you get your earnest money, your um two thousand dollars or whatever, you get credit for that back, all right? But again, like I explained to people, your down payment, your earnest money, your down payment, your uh closing costs, those two those total different things. Your, I'm getting kind of tired tongue here, but <laughs> you're right, girl. <laughs> but yeah, your down payment is your down payment. This is like what you're gonna need the three and a half percent down. It has nothing to do with the closing costs. Closing costs are your lender fees and your um your attorney fees. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you need to get ready on that because you're gonna need out of pocket coming in. You're gonna need your earnest money your appraisal fee and your uh, home inspection fee. And that's very, very important to get that home inspection done. There's so many people go in, well, I don't have no money. I, don't, I barely gonna have money to bring to the closing table. You need the home inspection, okay? That's an important. You need that before you get an appraisal done. But those are the three out of pocket fees you're gonna need as before you even get to the closing table, all right? But again, like I said, in order to get these things, you have to set a budget. You, if you know you're going to want to get a house next year, okay, you know you're going to need your earnest money, your appraisal fee, your home inspection fee, set a budget, pay yourself first. That's a, that's a mindset in what you should be doing anyway. Put yourself just like a bill. Okay, fine, I'll pay myself. This is my bill this month. I'm going to pay myself $200. Put that to the side in your petty cash so when you get ready to get your home, you have your, uh, your appraisal fee, your home inspection fee, your earnest money. Wow. Uh, again, there are, you will know if you are mortgage ready because what you would do, you there's ways that you can find out, you can calculate your own, your own um, ratios, okay? I mean, we're here to do it for you, but in order to get mortgage ready, in order to get mortgage ready, you uh, have, um, you just have to, you have to set a budget. You have to pay yourself first. And you have to go to the pro through the programs. You have an FHA convention, and you also have a lot of different programs out there. But just, like, just get with the lender, uh, me and Pauline, Jared, whoever lender, whatever company you're using, just get with them and make sure you're just not doing too much with your credit that you think that you're doing, but you're messing yourself up. And I say, like I say, get mortgage ready. You have to put get a mindset. You know you're going to get a house for next year. You know you need to start saving. So you just like I said, you set yourself, give yourself a budget. Make sure you put yourself on your budget. Okay. Wow. Love it. Well, Angela, thank you so much, girl. Y'all heard it here. You heard it here first. You heard, you heard a lot of the same things over and over again that we were talking about today, right? Mindset. Starting with your mindset first. You got to believe that this is possible. You got to believe before you start that it's possible. Getting your credit right. Getting your budgeting right. Talking to a loan officer, talk to that loan officer first. You got to get with your loan officer to understand what you qualify for. There are a list. I think at Movement, I heard a sad thing. We have like 3,000 products at Movement, right? You have your non-QM, you have your, your normal, your FHA conventional. We have our own down payment assistance or down payment assistance locally across the country. The list goes on and on and on. So talk to your loan officer first. Create a plan, create a home ownership plan and understand a lot of folks. I was one of those individuals. I was afraid of hearing no. I was afraid of getting turned down. So I didn't take that next step. I didn't take the first step of owning my first home because I was afraid. So I encourage anyone out there listening today, understand we say this at every Grab the Key event. It's possible. It's possible to own your first home today. And so to do so, contact your loan officers, your local loan officers, squads. I'm going to put my email in the chat for folks out there listening nation, nationwide. If you want to speak to somebody in different markets, you want to speak to somebody in these markets, you obviously have these fantastic individuals here on the call. 
we are here to help you take the next steps of owning a home. As you heard me earlier, do one thing. Do one thing as you jump off this call. We thank everybody out there today. Pauline, thank you. Angela, thank you. Jarek, thank you. Kim, thank you. Zach, Portia, everybody on the call here today. Thank you all so, so much uh, for making Grab the Key virtual possible on Juneteenth. For everybody out there that joined us, thank you so much. If you're local with some, some of our folks at a watch party, if you got questions, you got folks there locally to ask, answer some questions for you. Thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic day.